Those who have never been to a lowrider show, a lowrider event, I would almost challenge them to go to that and see what it's really about being in that atmosphere, being with some really good people. And I would almost guarantee that it would open their eyes to something they didn't think was actually going on. Low riding uh, for me uh, was, uh, I'm originally from Chicago, and, and so in Chicago, the low rider scene was small, but, but it was strong. I always wanted to be around the cars, so I would hang out at this car wash, and a lot of guys would come and wash the cars there and detail them, and I would just hang out there and help them out, and they would tip me a couple bucks uh, to help them drive the cars. That's where I really first saw it, realized that there was a, a low rider magazine, it was car shows, there was these things and I was hooked from there. I saw the camaraderie, I saw the brotherhood, I saw the family-orientated atmosphere, uh, and then the art of, of the cars was just something I had never seen. Once the seed was planted, I, I was hooked, uh, and I've been into it ever since. I have a 1968 Chevy Impala convertible. It's a solid white with a light blue pearl to it. Has a two-pump hydraulic setup with four batteries from Black Magic Hydraulics. Uh, has 13-inch Zeniths, uh, laced with 520 wheels. Has an all-black solid uh, interior with the original look and the original 327 engine. Some of the accessories are the uh, original compass, the tilt steering, the hideaway lights, the original tissue box, the sound bar, and the skirts. My license plate is uh, my car club, Impala's Car Club. Uh, when I joined the club uh, three and a half years ago, uh, I joined while I was in San Diego, and so I still fly that plaque today. Uh, I've had the car for about a year and a half now. I inherited it from a fellow car club member. In order to make it mine, I, I gutted out the interior. The interior used to be white. I made it black. I added some more uh, mechanical features just to make sure it ran, because uh, uh, I do like to drive it quite a bit. The convertible is actually my favorite feature of the car. It's just a different feeling, dropping the top, sunny day, uh, even a cloudy day, it, it doesn't matter. There's just something about the freedom it gives you, uh, the openness it gives you, just cruising along with the family. It's just it's something special. Yeah, so I'm uh, originally from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I grew up uh, northwest side, I bounced around a lot. My dad, uh, was born in uh, East Los Angeles, moved to Chicago in the early 70s. My mom was born in Chicago, Puerto Rican family. Uh, they moved from Puerto Rico uh, to Chicago in the uh, late 50s. My mom is a recently retired claims and medical records coder and keeper. She was a dedicated uh, person, stuck with the same profession uh, for multiple years. Her recent retirement was much deserved. My dad was a janitor to a bank, uh, moved up to a maintenance technician, got into the security realm, and right now he is currently a senior vice president uh, for fraud and money laundering for a bank. You search for heroes, you know, and everybody has a hero, and you know, he's definitely my, my true hero. He's worked very hard, no education, and somehow was uh, able to rise the, the corporate ladder and has done very well for himself. Uh, and he is definitely an example to follow. Both of them have, have impacted my life uh, extremely. My parents met on a blind date, uh, and soon after that, um, I came about. And he married in 1984, uh, divorced in 1987. Soon after uh, my parents a divorce. My grandmother from my mom's side was diagnosed with ALS. My mom wanted to be near her, so we had to move into the inner city, a little bit of rougher area. During the summers, I have family in Arizona, so we would come to Arizona, or I would come oftentimes by myself to spend the summer with my cousins and family in Arizona. My cousins in Arizona were more my age, uh, and so that was a way that my mom used to keep me out of the streets and keep me from the neighborhood that we were in, which was exposed with, you know, multiple gangs, multiple drugs, things like that. Uh, I never wanted to leave Arizona. I, I always wanted to stay there. You know, nevertheless, I had to go back to Chicago. I did, toughened it out, 
I went to two different high schools. First one I stayed in for two years. Uh, then my mom was able to get me out to the suburbs. So I moved to a different high school uh, where I graduated from. My uncles were, you know, they were my uncles, but they were also my big brothers. Uh, and the youngest one, my uncle Sammy, uh, he's the closest in age to me. You know, they say it takes a tribe. Well, they were the tribe, uh, and they were my big brother figures. They looked after me, uh, kept me out of harm's way when, when they knew that I was exposed to those things. You know, aside from my parents getting divorced, um, they knew, hey, that's, that's still our nephew. And they came to my mom and said, we would not be shut out of his life. You know, we're going to be a part of it. We want to be a part of it. She was more than welcoming to have them come pick me up to do things with them. Six brothers, each one of them, uh, had, had their role, and they all took time uh, to help raise me and help be a part of my life. To this day, I still have that solid relationship with each and every one of them. I had a 91 Toyota Camry, and I dedicated the car uh, to my uncle, uh, who had recently passed at that time, uh, and I named the car My Blue Heaven. Had the mural of myself and him on the cover, uh, and, and named it that for him. Growing up, I actually struggled in school. I don't think it was a lack of intelligence. I think it was a lack of effort. I did not have the greatest work ethic. Uh, I was very lazy. My mom was on me about it. Uh, and anytime I went to go visit my dad, a lot of manual labor, shoveling snow, you know, cleaning up the yard, things like that. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was getting taught a lot of lessons. In early 1997, I was in my last year of high school, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Was I going to go to college? And we didn't really have the means at that time. And because I was aware of my worth ethic, I think I was hesitant for that reason. But I also knew what, what kind of financial burden that could be, you know, because I didn't want to put them in that position. And so I went back and forth that last school year. Uh, and then December of 97, I chose to join the Army. Maybe this is the challenge I need. Maybe this is where I can develop some kind of self-discipline and a better work ethic. And so I realized that I think the Army was it. I signed up, and uh, June of 1998, I shipped off to basic training. Throughout my 22 years, I've deployed multiple times uh, to Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Afghanistan. Along the way with each of those deployments, I've had different hardships. I totaled three concussions. Uh, one was from a bad airborne jump, one from an IED blast, and one was you know, playing some sports activities. And due to that, I was recently diagnosed with a mild TBI, which is a mild uh, traumatic brain injury. Basically, my brain has been shook so many times that I have developed memory loss. I have slurred speech sometimes, and um, my vision and hearing has been uh, impaired. I am currently uh, being seen by a therapist. Uh, I go to occupational therapy, I go to hearing, vision, and uh, behavioral health. It, it took a lot of different things, you know, to, to get to the level I'm at now. I am an infantryman by trait, so I have been in multiple line infantry units. I have been a drill instructor. I also taught uh, the senior level ROTC program at San Diego State where I was a senior military instructor. Uh, I've been on active duty now for 22 years. I'm currently a master sergeant and I work in the operations section uh, for 3rd Brigade 1st Armored Division. Well, I took full advantage of every opportunity that the Army gave me. Where I wanted to diversify myself and make sure that I can have multiple things to offer uh, when, I'm, when I'm retired. One of the things I'm trying to do is, uh, is to complete my degree. Uh, I'm currently in pursuit of it. It's in uh, organizational leadership and leadership development from the University of Louisville. I'm looking forward to it and I'm eager to, to finish it um, for my family uh, and to, to be an example to, to the young ones in my family and the, the young ones that I, I hope to work with afterwards. Throughout my time in the Army, I've never shelved my lifestyle, my lowrider lifestyle. One of the things that I always told my younger soldiers was, be who you are, all right? The uniform that we put on is a representation of our profession, but don't forget where you came from. I oftentimes would drive my car to work 
that oftentimes turned heads, but I always said no matter how much rank I got or what position that I got, I'm not going to change who I am. Low riding for me is, is therapeutic. You know, when you come back from a deployment and you do all this stuff, you want to take that uniform off sometimes. And the weekends were for that. Low riding has kept me going over deployments. I had people sending me low rider magazines and I'm in the middle of Iraq looking at low rider magazines, middle of Afghanistan, and using that as a driving force to boost my own morale and look forward to something, you know, when I returned. But it was a, a tool that I that I had, it was a way of, of being for me. I did a report when I was in high school about the stereotypes of low riding. At the same time, I took some of that paper, condensed it down, and I sent it off to Lowrider Magazine. I was a young teenager, put together a paper for high school, and now here I am um, speaking about that. Uh, so yeah, it definitely feels it's, it's come full circle. It's an honor and it's, it, it's a great opportunity. My wife and son have, have played a, an immense role in, in my life. I met my wife uh, at a time where I was probably not in my best state. I had recently lost somebody close to me and was going through some things. And here comes my wife, who completely saves me, uh, takes me out of some dark times. She's my rock. She's my backbone. She supports everything I do and genuinely supports it. She goes to things because she wants to, not because I pressure her or she has to. Having them next to me in the car, top down, Sunday afternoon is, I mean, it's the dream come true. I remember being a kid and reading the magazines and and uh, and, uh, and wanting to be there one day. And I finally made it. I finally made it. And having her, <clears throat> Having her be a part of it is something I can't describe. I don't believe anybody's a victim. I don't believe in a victim mentality. I believe in things happened and you get the cards that you're dealt uh, and it's up to you to figure that out and it's up to you to use your resources, use your family members, use people that are experienced and then develop your own ways and your own ideas of how you're going to get through something, how you're going to pursue something. You go and you get yours, you know, and you make a path for yourself and you work hard, you dedicate yourself. A lot of people in the lowrider community, we all share the same stories. We've come from divorce backgrounds and, you know, humbling times and, and or poverty or rough neighborhoods. You know, I am no different. The other thing that we do have in common is that we've pushed ourselves. I've pushed myself, you know, I challenged myself, found a way and said, I'm not gonna be like the normal guy, I'm not gonna be like the next guy, you know, and I'm not gonna feel sorry for myself. The challenge was there, it was up to me to figure it out. I used some resources and I made a path and I, I believe that others uh, should do the same. My name is Rick Solis. I'm a Master Sergeant in the United States Army and I'm a lowrider role model. <laughs>